Good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the PHN, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's session with Dr. Ted Stockloza, who's going to be speaking about common problems in gastroenterology and hepatology. Um, before going any further, though, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Wiradjuri Nation and the different nations on which all of us are meeting tonight. I'd like to acknowledge that we work on traditional lands of many Aboriginal clans and pay respect as to elders past, present, future and emerging and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water, culture and community. We are committed to working in the spirit of partnership and collaboration with our region's Aboriginal communities and working to improve their health, emotional and social wellbeing. I warmly welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander Australians who are present with us tonight. Um, just uh, a little bit of the usual housekeeping, which is just to draw your attention to the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Later on, um, when it's time for questions, um, as we go through, I think Ted will be inviting people to submit questions to the chat box. Everyone's uh, on mute otherwise. Um, so, let me now give you a bit of an introduction, some little background detail about Ted. Um, Dr. Ted Stoklotha attained his medical qualification from the University of Tasmania, and he has a master's in medicine in epidemiology from the University of Sydney. He completed his gastroenterology and hepatology advanced training at Royal Prince Alfred and the Prince of Wales Hospitals. He's been working as a full-time gastroenterologist and hepatologist at Dubbo Base Hospital and soon will be starting in private practice. He has Gastroenterological Society of Australia accreditation to perform colonoscopy and gastroscopy and has regular public lists with anaesthetic support. He has an interest in hepatology having trained for a year at the National Liver Transplant Unit at PA and has close ties with the liver clinic here in Dubbo. So, Ted, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you everyone for, um, for coming to listen tonight. So, um, I'll be presenting on common problems in gastroenterology and hepatology. Okay, so in this talk, uh, we're going to talk about interpreting, diagnosing and treating issues associated with abnormal liver enzymes. We're also going to talk about identifying and treating patients with chronic liver disease. And we're also going to talk about an approach to patients with suspected functional gastrointestinal issues, um, mainly irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is abnormal liver enzymes. Um, this is a very, very common uh, problem uh, in the hospital and in, in general practice, and we'll, we'll do an overview. So um, I think the first thing to do on history is to inquire about risk factors for liver disease, uh, the most important of which are alcohol and risk factors for bloodborne viral transmission. So uh, injecting drug use, tattoos or blood transfusion. Um, country of birth and travel history is also important, um, particularly for viral hepatitis. Uh, medications, uh, many of which uh, can be prescribed over the counter. So there are many over the counter um, medications and herbal supplements which can contribute to liver injury, which aren't necessarily volunteered by patients and we'll only find out about if we take a fairly detailed history. Um, also, family history of liver disease is important, uh, as is risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or what's now been relabeled as metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And uh, pregnancy um, has its own uh, set of diagnoses specific to pregnancy, which can be associated with abnormal liver tests. Uh, biliary disease is also important uh, to assess for. Um, does the patient have abdominal pain, weight loss or fevers? Um, have they had a cholecystectomy? And in patients, particularly with chronic liver disease, it's important to identify features of decompensation, such as jaundice, societis, and cephalopathy or bleeding, which we'll discuss more later in the talk. So uh, on examination, we look for evidence of chronic liver disease, um, things like spider nevi, um, on the, on the upper torso, muscle wasting, scratch marks, palmar erythema, 
we look for evidence of decompensated cirrhosis. So has the patient, you know, turned bright yellow before our eyes or are they developing encephalopathy or thinking trouble, um, which can be a sign that their chronic liver disease has, has decompensated. Do they have evidence of portal hypertension? Does the patient have ascites or splenomegaly or caput medusa, which are large veins on the belly? And is there a clue to the possible cause of liver disease on examination, such as Dupuytren's contraction for alcohol, um, viral hepatitis with tattoos or track marks, or congestive hepatopathy with clinical evidence of right heart failure with elevated jugular venous pressure? So I think um, it's important when we look at LFTs, there are a whole bunch of lab of, of lab laboratory tests, and it's important to look at them in groups. Otherwise, they seem like a long list of, of numbers which don't really mean that much. So we can group these into cholestatic, transaminitis, synthetic function, and platelets. So cholestatic liver enzymes are things like bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and GGT. Um, so these uh, can indicate, um, uh, oh, sorry, are you guys seeing my screen there? Hang on. You, can you see the PowerPoint? I've got the Superman slide there, Ted. We can see it, Ted. Yep. You can see everything. Okay. So yep. um, I, I'll, I'll just try and put this out of the way. Sorry, one sec. Can I close this window? You can only see your slides, Ted. We're good. Oh, okay, excellent. Okay, good. Um, all right. So uh, cholestatic liver enzymes, so bilirubin, ALP, and GGT. So this can also um, indicate, indicate issues of cholestasis. Um, uh, so problems with the bile uh, flow through the liver or bile ducts. It's important to remember that ALP can also be from bone. Um, transmenases, so ALT and AST, and these can indicate damage, direct, direct damage to the liver or hepatocytes. And the ratio of this is important because if AST is much higher than ALT, this can indicate some specific situations like alcohol or cirrhosis. Um, and synthetic function uh, is also important to look at. So this is INR and albumin. And this is true, truly a measure of liver function. So we call all of these tests liver function tests, but the tests that truly reflect whether the liver is working or not uh, are INR and albumin. Um, and platelets are also important to look at because thrombocytopenia can occur in cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And it's in fact, one of the best uh, blood markers to determine if the patient has cirrhosis or not. Okay, so this is another slide uh, summarizing uh, what we've just talked about. So um, as we've said, hepatocyte integrity is indicated um, by ALT and AST. And it's important to remember um, that um, AST uh, can also come from can also come from muscle, and if it's significantly elevated, we want to think about doing a CK to find out if that's the cause of that. Um, ALP, as we've said, it comes from bone, um, so it's important to remember. You know, if we have an elderly patient uh, with an isolated ALT ALP rise, uh, that can be indicative of a bone problem or a bone metastasis, um, particularly in older males. Um, and in particular, um, rises in ALP can also come from placenta, and this is common in pregnancy. Um, GGT, um, as we've said, this is another marker of cholestasis. It could also indicate that the patient is consuming alcohol in excess. And bilirubin um, is, again, another cholestatic enzyme that can also be a, a, a marker of uh, the breakdown of red cells. And as we've said, uh, liver function is indicated by serum albumin and prothrombin time. So when we're evaluating liver tests, it's important to think about how long this has been going on. Is this an acute problem? Has this only been going for six weeks or is it chronic? Has this been going on for months? What's the pattern? Is it a hepatocellular? Um, is it a hepatocellular pattern? So is it AST and ALT or is it cholestatic? Is it more ALP, GGT and bilirubin? What's the context? So what has been happening to the patient? This is critically important. So has the patient been exposed to toxins? Um, what are their symptoms? Have they had investigations or treatments recently? And also the other thing to really think about when you're looking at liver tests is how bad is this? So if the patient uh, has acute liver failure, which is a very rare but important diagnosis, they can have um, signs of encephalopathy. 
Um, so elevated LFTs, LFTs in the thousands, ASTs and ALTs in the thousands, hepatic encephalopathy, confusion, and coagulopathy. So elevated INR, and this can be a this is a medical emergency, and this person needs to be uh, transferred to a hospital. And also the other thing to think about um, is does the patient have evidence of cirrhosis, which we'll talk about, which is a severe form of liver scarring. Um, that can lead to life-threatening complications of liver failure, variceal bleeding, and liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma. So if the patient has a mild transaminitis, so the ALT or AST is mildly elevated, how long has this been going on for? If this is new, I think I would suggest rechecking it because it may actually spontaneously resolve. So common causes are things like medications, a viral hepatitis, including acute viral hepatitis. So if this hasn't been going on for very long, this could be a hepatitis A, hepatitis E, CMV, Epstein Barr virus, um, infectious mononucleosis. Um, is this uh, hemochromatosis or is this fatty liver or is this autoimmune liver disease or Wilson's? So these are all other things to think about. I'll just mention briefly, Wilson's disease is quite a rare diagnosis, but if you ever see um, a younger patient with um, neuropsychiatric features who's got hemolysis and a low ALP, just keep this in mind because it's it's rare, but it can come up. All right, so now let's talk about a higher transaminosis. So we're talking about uh, ALT and AST, which are 10 to 50 times the upper limit of normal, so very high. So this can occur in ischemia. So in ischemic injury, the AST will typically be higher than the ALT. And in an ischemic injury, there'll be usually be other signs of ischemia. So perhaps the creatinine is elevated, perhaps the lactate is elevated, perhaps the troponin is also elevated. Toxic injury, again, um, similar to ischemia, very high uh, transmenitis. Um, and I think the most important toxin um, in our practice to think about is paracetamol. Um, so always, always take a, a paracetamol history and suspect paracetamol, particularly when there's also renal injury involved and um, always do a level, but don't be misled by a low level because that can off, this can often occur in the presence of a low paracetamol level. Acute viral hepatitis, this is another important thing to, to look for and to assess for. Um, acute biliary obstruction. So we typically talk about biliary obstruction being a case of cholestatic liver enzymes or raised ALP or GGT, but in fact, um, in an acute biliary obstruction, a transaminitis, a marked transaminitis can occur. And alcoholic hepatitis um, usually occurs with an AST much higher than the ALT, but to a lower level than the other diagnosis that we've talked about. So cholestasis, does the patient have an, a an elevated ALP, GGT, bilirubin? So we say when a patient has an elevated GGT and ALP, we say this is cholestatic. And when the patient also has an elevated uh, bilirubin, we might call these obstructive LFTs because it might indicate the bile is not flowing properly. So does the patient have evidence of bile duct obstruction? Do they have pain? May they have gallstones? Is it painless? Maybe they have a, a tumor. Does the patient have the classic pattern of Charcot's triad of jaundice, fever, and right upper quadrant pain, which is again a medical emergency requiring hospitalization. Does the patient have a primary liver disease uh, causing cholestasis, such as PVC or PSC? Does the patient have an infiltrative disease of the liver, sarcoidosis, lymphoma, metastatic disease, or are there medications? So antibiotics, particularly augmentant, um, antifungals, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, psychotropic medications. These can all cause cholestasis. On the topic of medications, it's important to try and recognize which medications are hepatotoxic, and this can be very, very hard to work out, and you, uh, it'll be you know, impossible for any of us to memorize which drugs cause what pattern of liver injury. And I'd highly recommend this site to you, which is um, Livertox, which is a uh, online drug-induced liver injury library. Um, which is freely available and can give uh, people an idea as to the pattern and severity of liver injury to expect uh, with various drugs. Okay, so we've already touched on this, but isolated rises in enzymes are important to notice. So in general, um, if a patient has strange liver enzymes, perhaps all of their liver enzymes will be elevated to some degree. But if it's just one of them, that can indicate a different scenario. So if just bilirubin is elevated, this might indicate that the patient has hemolysis, 
Um, they might have Gilbert syndrome, so decreased liver uptake of bilirubin, an um, um, unconjugated hyperbilirubin EBIA, which is present in up to 5% of the population. Um, or do they have decreased hepatic excretion, such as the causes of cholestasis that we've already discussed? Does the patient have an isolated uh, GGT elevation, which can indicate alcohol intake in excess? Um, does the patient have an isolated ALP, uh, which can, as we've said, indicate bone disease or metastatic uh, cancer or prostate cancer or pregnancy? So this is um, derived from the UK guidelines, which will be presented as one of the key references for the investigation and clinical pattern recognition in liver injury. And this is a very busy slide, and but this is a very useful resource, I think, to have available. So the key here is to recognize patterns of liver injury. So um, is it a hepatetic uh, picture? Is it a cholestatic liver? Um, is it just the bilirubin up? Um, does the patient have evidence of synthetic failure? So is there a problem with liver function? Um, as we've said, high INR, low albumin, jaundice, this is an, this is an emergency. And working through these uh, various algorithms, we can determine what tests we need to do and, and who we need to refer for further investigation and treatment. So that's the end of the last uh, section on, ident on dealing with ab abnormal LFTs. Does anyone have any questions on that? I, I don't think we've got any questions yet in the chat box, Ted, but I was just wondering about paracetamol. And yes. um, there are a lot of people in the community, um, people with osteoarthritis who are taking yep. um, a full dose of paracetamol, like four grams every day. Is that yes. always safe? Um, so a person who has um, takes the prescribed maximum amount of paracetamol for a, a reasonable period of time in the setting of particularly um, glutathione deficiency or malnutrition, um, can be a serious problem and can lead to serious liver injury. Um, yeah. And I think uh, in any patient who you've assessed and found to have abnormal limbs, liver enzymes, particularly a transaminitis, so we're talking really more about the AST and ALT. So if the patient yeah. has an elevated um, AST and ALT, sorry, and um, evidence of um, of liver injury in the context of paracetamol use, it would be important uh, to identify that. And the, the patients who are really in trouble, as we've already identified, are the patients who have developed signs of coagulopathy. So if you see a patient um, who's on paracetamol who perhaps has an elevated INR or is perhaps developing, developing renal dysfunction, that can be an indicator that something is badly wrong and to seek help. Thank, thanks, Ted. Um, I've got a question here from one of um, the attendees. Isolated oh. ALT increase, what, what mm. conditions does that happen in? ALT. ALT. ALT, okay. Um, so uh, ALT is um, usually uh, from the liver. It's more AS, um, AST that's, that's from things like um, skeletal muscle or heart. Um, ALT is a good, is often used in a marker of um, hepatocyte da damage because as I hope I can demonstrate from this slide here, it's actually reasonably specific to the liver. Um, if you guys can see that slide. So, yes. so um, a lot of the other liver enzymes can come from other various places, but ALT is, is good in that it's usually from the liver. Okay. And another question from me, Ted. The isolated yeah. gamma GT, uh, I yes. guess personally, I often that often catches my attention, and I take a, an alcohol history. Um, yeah. How how specific is that? Because I I think my um, my rate of of sort of finding evidence that's on history of excessive alcohol is is actually um, my success rate yeah. is quite. Yeah, so look, um, GGT can be elevated um, because of enzyme induction uh, from many, many different medications um, and over-the-counter medications and herbal supplements. And um, it can be up for other reasons, like perhaps fatty liver, for example. 
um, and it's quite common to be elevated. I think what I'll talk about in a few slides from now, I'm just going to zoom forward a little bit. So what I was going to talk about a few slides from now is when we're evaluating um, alcohol intake, and um, if we find that a patient has um, moderate alcohol intake and we check her GGT and the GGT is elevated in that setting, um, so the GGT is above um, 100, that's actually an indication to go looking for fibrosis. Right. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Sort of, yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not a hugely specific market. No. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um all right. So I suppose now we'll talk about um identifying and treating patients with chronic liver disease. So um oh, are there any other questions or there are a few, Ted. I'm not sure that you're seeing oh, okay. Jenny. So we have one from Manpreet. Um, for mild transaminitis, how often do yes. you recommend to check LFTs? So the key, I think, the key with a mild transaminitis for me is that if it's new, just recheck it. So this goes back to um, the idea of how long has this been going on. So when we're talking about liver tests, we say, look, if this has been going on for about six weeks, we call it acute. If it's been going on for half a year, this is more of a chronic issue. So um, how long? Look, if this persists for uh, six months, then we'd call it a chronic problem and it probably warrants further investigation. A question does from that Mina. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure just let us know. Okay, okay. Yeah. Another um, question from Mina. Sorry, Jenny, can yeah. you see those questions? I, I can see them now. Thanks, okay. Liz. Um, you might be moving on towards this, um, Ted. What about autoimmune yeah. hepatitis? What investigations can be done? And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. So I didn't specifically include this in the talk, but um, if you go on Google and you MD cap, you do uh, you search for simplified autoimmune hepatitis score. So you just find MD calc and you find what's called the simplified autoimmune hepatitis score. That's a hugely helpful score um, that basically allows you to determine uh, what probability the patient in front of you might have autoimmune hepatitis based on a few simple blood tests. Um, I'm sorry I didn't include that in today's talk, but we, we have a lot to get through. Thanks, Ted. And I think there's just uh, one other question. Uh, how, how bad is the function when we consider or that we need to reduce or cease paracetamol if a patient mm. is on paracetamol? So yeah. at what point would we tell them to pull back on dosing? Okay. Okay. Look, I'd say that um, the thing to think about is sort of a mild, a mild transaminitis is actually not a really big deal. But I think if if you have liver tests that are abnormal um, for periods for long periods of time, so we're talking uh, weeks to months to years, they can over time those liver tests are likely to indicate low level inflammation, um, and low level inflammation unfortunately over a really really long period of time can lead to scarring. So I think the key is if you've got elevated um, liver enzymes, I'm sorry, I can't give you a precise answer on this, but I think um, if they're elevated for months and months on end, it's probably a good idea to try and wind them back a bit um, because if this sort of thing goes on for years, you can actually end up doing some permanent damage. Got it. Yep. Yeah. So scarring and cirrhosis. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, any others? Or? Look, I, um, sorry, there's just one that's come in. Um, um, does isolated Gilbert syndrome in children require further investigation? Oh, yes. So, no, I wouldn't say so. So, if you have a patient with an isolated, um, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and the rest of their LFTs are, are normal, um, I think that's, no, I don't think that requires further investigation. Thanks, and, and I, I think we're up to date with our questions now. Okay. 
All right. So um, we're going to talk about um, identifying and treating patients uh, with chronic liver disease. So the key clinical questions here, I think, is what is the cause of the liver disease? Does the patient have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis? So these are indications uh, for further evaluation and treatment. And does the patient have features of decompensation? So this is a um, slide taken from the uh, 30th liver transplantation report in Australia talking about indications for, for liver transplantation. And um, there's some interesting trends here, I think. So hepatitis C over the last five years has declined pretty enormously. Um, and the drugs that we have available to us now are, are really, really good. Um, as you can see there, liver cancer in the red line, interestingly, is actually creeping up and continues to increase over time. Um, and the other thing to, to notice is that the black line, alcohol, um, certainly hasn't gone away. It sort of goes up and down, but it's, it's always there and it probably will always be there. So, okay, so we've already touched on this a bit, but we'll go into it. So what, what might indicate alcoholic liver disease? So we, we talked about the elevated GDT and we talked about the AST to ALT ratio greater than two that can indicate um, a degree of inflammation from alcohol or alcoholic hepatitis. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease often presents um, with, a, with a transmenitis, mild transmenitis, and ultrasound evaluation uh, is recommended to look for evidence of um, steatosis or hyperattenuation. Um, chronic hepatitis B um, can be ascertained for by a person who has a positive uh, HB surface antigen. Um, at which point um, HBE uh, antigen can then not go on to be investigated, um, as well as the DNA and looking for changes in the van types. Uh, chronic hepatitis C um, should usually be investigated first with a positive hepatitis C uh, viral antibody. I think the only qualifying thing to say for this is that um, the prevalence of a hepatitis C antibody being positive in injecting drug users is in the order of 70 to 80 percent. So I think if you have a patient who's got a history of any injecting drug use, I, I think I'd be very inclined just to order a hepatitis C RNA and not do an antibody at the first instance um, to just move forward with their treatment and evaluation. Um, hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, so we're looking at a person uh, with an elevated um, transparent saturation. Um, we're looking at their iron binding capacity and we're thinking about for patients who have a transparent saturation of greater than 45%, whether um, we're going to do genetic testing to look for um, uh, alleles associated with hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, as we've said with autoimmune hepatitis, um, so the main markers we're looking at, we're looking at anti-nuclear body, um, we're looking at uh, an anti-smooth muscle antibody, we're looking at um, at an anti-liver kidney microsomal, microsomal antibody, so LKM, anti-LKM antibody. We're looking at elevated IgG levels. We're looking at um, the absence of viral hepatitis. Um, we're looking at particularly women, young women, and we're looking for um, a history of other autoimmune disease and perhaps a family history um, of liver disease. And that's what sort of might indicate to us that yes, maybe this patient has autoimmune hepatitis. So that we would then go on to do a simplified autoimmune hepatitis score and try and determine if this is what's going on. PBC um, and PSC. So the diagnosis of PSC is made by uh, cholangiography um, and uh, PBC, the diagnosis is primarily made by an antimitochondrial antibody. And again, um, this is an autoimmune type disease which is more common uh, in women and um, is important to recognize because PBC is very easily treatable um, with ursodeoxycholic acid, and PSC is not easily treatable and is associated with a significant risk of cancer and liver failure and um, indicates that the patient needs uh, further investigation and treatment. Uh, Wilson's disease, I think we've touched on already. So we're talking about a low uh, serum ceruloplasmin. Um, again, we're talking about younger patients, um, perhaps who have hemolysis and neuropsychiatric features and the low ALP, um, who we're going to do a 24-hour urinary copper excretion if we suspect that they have it to determine the diagnosis. And again, alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin deficiency is another rare but um, disease that's easy to screen for. 
Okay, so here we have a slide um, talking about uh, the progression of liver disease. So as we've already said, um, healthy livers can develop steatosis or fatty liver, um, particularly in the case of non-alcoholic fatty liver or, the, or alcohol exposure, um, can develop steatosis. Over time, fatty liver, so this, this, this is important to recognize. So 25% of the population, so one in four to one in five people is gonna have fatty liver in the community. And then somehow out of those group of people, about one in 20 people in the community is gonna develop steatohepatitis or inflammation. And then a proportion of those patients with inflammation are gonna have inflammation over long periods of time, which is gonna to lead to scarring and cirrhosis. And that cirrhosis can lead to uh, liver failure, can lead to hepatocellular carcinoma, it can lead to bleeding from esophageal varices. I think it's important to note that the main uh, causes of mortality in patients with fatty liver is still a heart attack and stroke. So liver disease is not the main driver of mortality, but it, but it is gonna occur in a small subgroup of our patients. And it's actually very hard to predict which patients those are going to be. But it's important that we recognize it early when it occurs. So um, which patients have significant fibrosis? So this is a score called an APRI score. So this is available again on MD Calc, um, whereby you can enter your um, AST and your platelet count to determine if a patient is likely to have advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis and this is particularly useful um, in things uh, like viral hepatitis and hepatitis C. Um, there's a similar score called a FIB4 which I haven't included here which uses similar parameters as well as age and, and yields similar results. Um, this I think is hugely helpful. So this is called the NAFLD fibrosis score and um, this is used to determine what proportion of those 20 to 25 percent of people in the community with fatty liver actually potentially have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis and need gastroenterological assessment. Um, so this is this is hugely helpful because this is going to help you identify which patients with fatty liver actually need further referral and investigation. Um, and this is available at um, nafldscore.com. And you can see there that you enter various intervals and it spits out a number which predicts the absence or presence of significant fibrosis or cirrhosis. So this is a schema um, for uh, working out people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I suppose that you'd see someone in the clinic, um, perhaps they have mildly deranged transaminases, um, perhaps they have an ultrasound which shows um, evidence suggested steatosis, um, perhaps they have risk factors for fatty livers like um, type 2 diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertriglyceridemia. Um, we perform a um, NAFLD fibrosis score and let's suppose um, that it's a high value. Um, this might deter show us that the patient has is at high risk of, of advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis and needs hepatology referral. However, the patient is more likely to have a low risk of advanced fibrosis and can be managed in uh, primary care with risk factor optimization. Um, alcohol, so this is a commonly encountered problem. Um, this is the audit, audit C questionnaire, which um, allows a, a fairly quick objective way of determining if a patient has problem drinking. Um, and this is a schema we touched on briefly before. So um, the audit C questionnaire can be used uh, to determine a traffic light system of how harmful someone's drinking is likely to be, um, which can then uh, lead us to either continue to follow the patient up as in primary care or investigate further for um, cirrhosis or fi advanced fibrosis. Um, and as we previously said, patients with um, the, the moderate alcohol exposure, we can check GDT and an elevated GDT in this case can actually be an indication um, to do a non-invasive measure of fibrosis such as Fibroscan to determine if that's the case. So severe alcoholic hepatitis um, is associated with heavy alcohol intake. Um, this is an important diagnosis to recognize. Um, it's relatively uncommon, but when it does occur, it carries a high mortality and is an indication for hospital admission. So patients can present with jaundice, fever, abdominal tenderness, or unwell, and it has a high, as we've said, high short-term mortality and can progress to multi-organ failure. And it's characterized by a madri discriminant function of greater than 32. 
So like almost everything I've talked about tonight, there's an um, online calculator, um, which helps you determine this um, in a fairly simple way. So the patient will usually um, present with an AST to LT ratio of two to one. So the AST will be higher and they may have other markers of chronic alcohol intake, like an elevated mean cell volume or TGT. And an in score of greater than 32 indicates severe alcoholic hepatitis, and these patients require hospital admission and consideration of glucocorticoid therapy. And the final slide I'd like to talk about um, in chronic liver disease is it's very important for us to identify if a patient has decompensated. So this, this um, the advent of fibro scan has allowed us to determine a lot of that a lot of patients with very well compensated liver disease in the community um, have cirrhosis but if if we manage and risk stratify um, their liver disease they're likely to their cirrhosis is not likely to decompensate unless their underlying disease isn't controlled but there's a, a, a significant subset of patients who will develop decompensation of their liver disease which essentially means that their liver is is no longer functioning as it should um, and leads to the accumulation of bilirubin jaundice societies hepatic encephalopathy variceal hemorrhage and um, hepatorenal syndrome so if we note that a patient with cirrhosis presents to primary care with jaundice or ascites or thinking trouble or, or bleeding or an, ele uh, an elevated creatinine this can be an indication that something has gone badly wrong and they require hospital admission. Okay, so that's the end of um, my chronic liver disease section. Does um, anyone have any questions on that? I don't, tell. I don't think we've got any new questions. I was just going over some of the algorithms. Um, yeah. And I guess if we've got copies of these slides, we can relook at them. Um, yeah. But there, there is an algorithm you just, I recall you mentioning you didn't have on there. Um, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't include the simplified autoimmune hepatitis score. No, I didn't. Um, but that, I think, it, yeah, if you have a reasonable suspicion that your patient might have autoimmune hepatitis, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, but again, you know, and we, we are always available. If you, if you do have a patient that you think, gosh, does this person have autoimmune hepatitis? Um, you can, you know, give us a call and we can talk about it as well. Okay. And and maybe um, maybe uh, the PHN can get that reference from you and we could send that through to anyone who's um, on tonight who's pretty keen to follow that up also themselves. No, absolutely. Yeah. I look, I was, I was quite worried about making this talk a bit too long as it is, but I'm happy to um, put that in. Yeah. That, that, Okay, um, there are a couple of more. Um, when to consider referring for PBC, PSC investigations? Yeah, um, sure. So look, yeah, so I think um, the important thing for people to know about PBC is the vast majority of PBC patients will be um, anti-mitochondrial antibody positive. Um, so, which is good because it's a simple blood test that we can all order. Um, yeah. And uh, when when the patient you know has um, persistently deranged liver enzymes and we and they're in a cholestatic pattern, and the anti mitochondrial antibody is negative, we can then do a bunch of tests for anti mitochondrial antibody negative PBC, which is getting into you know fairly specialised area, which I don't I don't think is necessarily needs to be done in general practice. That can I think that can definitely be referred to a hepatology clinic. Um, so I, th I think all patients with PBC, I, I, I appreciate the management isn't um, particularly, uh, there may be many GPs who are, are confident to manage that, but if you're not, I think, I think that pretty much all chronic liver diseases of that kind can be managed by a hepatologist. And sorry, the other question was about PSC, which is really a radiological diagnosis. So um, it relies on uh, a pretest suspicion, I think, and the radiologist is being told, look, we're looking for beading on the cholangiogram. And if they do see beading on the cholangiogram, um, so we're talking about uh, a CT cholangiogram or an MRCP, um, if the radiologist sees beading, um, it, particularly in the context of chronic liver disease, that can be a big clue. And that's, that's an important uh, trigger for referral to hepatology. Okay. 
Um, we've got a few questions from the same questioner. Um, I'll just tell you a question. Um, how do you clinically differentiate NASH versus simple steat steatosis? Yeah, Is sure. That so um, I think the 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 what the the H in NASH um, so is standing for um, hepatitis, so steatohepatitis, and that hepatitis um, is really indicated on bloods by the transaminases. So, so a patient um, with a persistently elevated transaminitis um, on blood tests could well be having uncontrolled inflammation. Um, so, if those transaminases are high and they re and they remain high for a long period of time, that can be a good indicator that yes, this patient has ongoing uncontrolled liver inflammation and sooner or later this may lead to scarring. Yeah. Um, and for a person diagnosed with PBS, how often do you recommend fibro scan for surveillance? Uh, or PBC or, or which, think, sorry? Uh, PBC P would be. Or PSC, PSC. Okay, so the, the really important things in surveillance and PSC are, are that PSC patients are at very high risk of colorectal cancer, uh, liver cancer, and gallbladder cancer. So the screening in PSC centers around doing a colonoscopy every year. Um, there are no guidelines for looking for gallbladder or cholangiocarcinoma surveillance in PSC, but that needs to be thought about at least fairly regularly. So these patients probably require um, at least uh, yearly ultrasound or CT to look for that. And um, there is also a risk of gallbladder cancer. And I think, again, ultrasound is an important um, important way to assess for that regularly. So yes, PSC, patients with PSC are at very high risk of developing various cancers and require a lot of surveillance. Thanks, Ted. And I think the... Um... We've actually got still quite a few questions. I wonder if you want to go on to um, um, your third section and come back. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So I think it's we, we've got to get on to irritable bowel syndrome because this is a very, very common problem that we all encounter fairly regularly. And um, it's... Unfor the fact that the very fact that it's a syndrome and we don't accurate we can't accurately describe the pathogenesis of it um, leads to a lot of I think confusion and a lot of uh, problems sort of correctly diagnosing and treating patients. So um, I've included here the Rome diagnostic criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. So this is a patient who's had um, abdominal pain at least one day late done one day a week. Um, over the last three months, but you'll notice in the end of the criteria that this has to be going on for about six months before diagnosis. So this is a patient who's had abdominal pain for about six months with two other criteria. So the pain has to be related to defecation or associated with a change in the stool frequency or fall. So this is important because it allows us to um, differentiate IBS from other undiagnosed causes of abdominal pain, like um, perhaps, um, uh, ovarian causes or renal stones, pancreatitis, etc. The fact that the pain is is luminal, so it's related to defecation and it's associated with a change in the stool, gives us a, an indication that something is going on in the bowel, um, and we can relate this pain to to coming from the bowel. Okay, so there are some subtypes um, of uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so C is where the more of a quarter, more than a quarter of your stools are hard, and less than a quarter of your stools are very soft. Um, di IBS diarrhea subtype is where more than a quarter of your stools are very soft, and less than a quarter are very hard. Uh, mixed is a, a bit of both. So more than a quarter are very soft, and more than a quarter are very hard. And um, IBS unspecified is where it doesn't actually meet any of the above criteria exactly. All right. So we fortunately now have um, good clinical guidelines um, from the American College of Gastroenterology based on um, systematic review and meta-analysis mostly for the management of irritable bowel syndrome, which is, I think, a big step forward in the way that we can manage this. Um, so the summary of these guidelines I'd like to discuss is the, the diagnosis um, and treatment. And treatment's really split up into pharmacotherapy, diet, and psychotherapy. And um, what I'd like you to sort of take away from this is that um, 
the treatments that we're going to talk about what are not sort of markedly superior to one another. So some patients will benefit from pharmacotherapy, some patients will benefit a lot from diet, and some patients will benefit a lot from psychotherapy. And um, this can be individualized to a really high degree. Okay, so um, the, rec the, the strong recommendation that patients with diarrhea undergo celiac serology because um, it's a relatively common disease, it affects one in 70 Australians. And the symptoms of abdominal pain and bloating with altered bowel habit often present um, in irritable bowel syndrome and can get confused fairly easily, I think, with celiac disease. So I think um, by doing some simple blood tests, um, we can diagnose with a high degree of diagnostic accuracy. So tissue transglutaminase, we're talking about a diagnostic accuracy of about 98%. Um, whether the patient has uh, celiac disease or not. And as we're all aware, there are significant uh, consequences of misdiagnosis, um, such as um, neuropsychiatric issues, increased the risk of lymphoma um, and uh, micronutrient deficiencies. Okay. So the authors also suggest that um, fecal, fecal calprotectin and C-reactive protein can be checked. Um, in patients uh, without alarm features and suspected um, IBS with diarrhea to rule out inflammatory bowel disease. So fecal uh, calprotectin um, is a great marker of intestinal inflammation, but unfortunately in Australia has an out-of-pocket expense of about 70 to 80 dollars. But um, it's highly sensitive and specific for um, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, C-reactive protein um, in a very low titer gives less than a 1% uh, probability of IBD, um, but is, is not shown to be uh, equivalent or superior to fecal calprotectin, unfortunately. So um, I think in my, gen in my clinical practice, I tend to use these markers in combination. Um, and in combination, it gives you a pretty good idea of whether the patient has significant intestinal inflammation or not um, without even doing a colonoscopy. Okay, um, so the authors of this guideline recommend against stool testing for enteric patients in all patients with IBS. Um, so I think the important thing to think about in terms of um, gastrointestinal infection um, with irritable bowel is that um, IBS often occurs within months of having an infection and post Post-infectious IBS uh, is more commonly seen in women and those exposed to antibiotics or where there's a history of anxiety or depression. And Giardia is the most common cause of this. And I think it's important for us to think about Giardia because um, what I've noticed starting to work in the community is I think there's a significant proportion of the population that is ex exposed to untreated water um, in, in consumption on a fairly regular basis. And I actually screen for Giardia a fair bit uh, in my clinical practice. So the risk factors um, to really be aware of uh, child and child care, children in childcare, untreated water or swimming, and backpackers and travellers, um, the latter of which we haven't had a lot of recently. Okay, so we recommend, uh, the authors of the guideline recommend against routine colonoscopy in uh, young patients without alarm features. Uh, so what are alarm features? So we're talking about uh, rectal bleeding, melina, unintentional weight loss. Um, again, we're talking about young patients. We're, we're talking about patients um, who don't have a significant family history. Um, we're talking about patients who don't have nocturnal or bloody diarrhea. We're talking about patients without iron deficiency anemia, which is, which is unexplained. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the authors recommend a positive diagnostic strategy as composed, uh, as appared to a um, strategy of exclusion for patients with IBS. So the, the point of this really is to lead to less unnecessary colonoscopy and to reduce time to effective therapy. And um, I think patients really, really appreciate it when even though we're talking about, we're talking about a syndrome and not a disease, but we can still diagnose it. So we can still say, look, um, this is a syndrome. This is a well-recognized syndrome. You fulfill the clinical criteria. Therefore, you have this condition and we're going to give you some treatment. Um, I think is a lot more satisfying for a patient rather than oh, look, we've investigated everything and we've still come up with nothing and look, you might have irritable bowel, I'm not really sure, and look, we'll try something and see how it works. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a sort of chronic and can be quite a debilitating condition and we need to sort of inspire some confidence in our patients. And I think that this helps enormously in doing that. So um, 
the authors recommend it soluble but not insoluble fiber. Sorry, soluble, not insoluble fiber be used to treat global IBS symptoms. So when we talk about soluble fiber, we're talking about things like psyllium, oats, barley, beans. Um, and psyllium uh, is actually a reasonable treatment um, for irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so we're talking about global symptoms. So psyllium can improve um, symptoms of pain in particular. And I actually use psyllium in both uh, subtypes of diarrhea subtype and constipation subtype um, and find it almost equally effective in both. Um, the risk ratio for symptoms, we're talking about pain not improving is 0.83 and the number needed to treat is only seven. And the preference for soluble fiber is really based off the idea that um, soluble fiber uh, in the large bowel uh, tends to absorb um, water and make the stool bulkier, whereas insoluble fiber tends to ferment uh, in the large bowel and can lead to excess gas, gas and bloating and flatulence. Um, and when we talk about insoluble fiber, we're talking about wheat, whole grains and some vegetables. Um, okay, so the authors recommend a limited trial of POBAP diet um, in RBS to improve global symptoms. Um, so the low quality evidence we have available to us suggests a benefit um, of symptom improvement in the order of something like 70% um, of patients. Um, it requires a properly trained GI dietitian to do because it's very, very complicated. Um, and the process of eliminating um, low FODMAP, uh, of eliminating FODMAP foods um, from the diet entirely and then systematically reintroducing them is quite a complex and confusing one and I think is very, very hard to do without a properly trained dietitian. Um, and the important thing to think about with the low format diet is that it's safe uh, and it doesn't have severe adverse effects, although uh, long-term over-restriction could lead to micronutrient deficiencies, but that hasn't been clearly demonstrated in clinical trials. Um, the authors also recommend, uh, they suggest the use of peppermint um, to provide a relief of global symptoms in RBS. Um, so there's a low quality of evidence, um, but there's a risk reduction of symptoms of about of over two. Um, from seven trials. Um, all of these trials interestingly used uh, peppermint oil on a regular basis, not PRN. So by the letter of the law, um, if we're expecting significant improvements in our patients based on the evidence available to us, we'd probably suggest using it regularly. Um, this is particularly good for patients who have symptoms, particularly of bloating or patients who want to try a natural therapy. This is very, very popular. Um, so tricyclic antidepressants. Um, can be used to treat global symptoms of IBS, so abdominal pain, and that's a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence. Um, so tricyclic antidepressants uh, have a variety of effects. So the noradrenaline blockade can directly treat the visceral pain that patients with IBS experience. The anticholinergic effects treat diarrhea, but consequently we also need to be cautious um, using tricyclics in our patients who are already constipated because we can make that worse. Um, and there are also dopaminergic effects, so these can uh, directly alleviate psychological distress. And the risk of symptoms not improving um, on this therapy is a, a 0.65 with a number needed to treat of, of about of 4.5. Um, so this is, this is an effective treatment in the right patients. So starting, um, the authors recommend starting at a low dose, like 10 milligrams, and looking out for adverse effects. So in particular, they're looking out for constipation and being very cautious in using this in patients who are already constipated. I probably generally wouldn't do this. Um, I'd normally only use this in my diarrhea subtype uh, IBS patients. Um, Gut-directed psychotherapies um, can be used to treat global IBS syndromes. Um, so several uh, RCTs have been conducted, but they haven't actually excluded patients on pharmacotherapy, which muddies the waters a little bit. Um, and there's a whole lot of gut-directed psychotherapies which have kind of been lumped together. So hypnosis, uh, CBT, mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness uh, strep, stress reduction. Um, it's really hard to quantify the benefit, but the number needed to treat appears to be very low and it appears to work for all subtypes and um, doesn't have any adverse effects. Um, the authors of this guideline recommend against the use of antispasmodics, um, in particular the use of hyacine. I've got to say, 
I do use a bit of hyacinth or buscopan um, in my patients. So, so the most recent um, evidence showed that symptom response for, for hyacinth or buscopan wasn't actually much, wasn't any better than paracetamol um, and has common uh, adverse effects such as dry mouth and blurred, blurred vision. So look, uh, in patients who have symptoms of severe cramping, um, who I don't think are going to have deleterious side effects from this, I do tend to use hyacinth. And I often, actually, I use it sometimes in combination with paracetamol because I think it might have an additive effect. Um, that's not really based on any strong evidence or recommendation, but um, it, I find it can work. Um, so the guidelines recommend avoiding uh, probiotics as there's there's just not enough evidence for this at this stage. Uh, routine food allergy testing, uh, they recommend against using things like bile acid sequestrants, so cholestyramine or questran, and they recommend against fecal transplant. And that's the end of that section. So does anyone have any questions about irritable bowel? Actually, I, I can't hear you. I'm just waiting for questions that might be related to that, Ted, but um, I have one or two. Um, yeah. Peppermint. Can uh, peppermint yeah. be in the form of peppermint tea, peppermint oil, or has it got to be a precise? Is there one form that's better than another? So I've got to say, um, I, I have no disclosures and I have no allegiance to any brands, but I tend to use Mintech um, just because it comes in a standardised dose and it's readily available. Um, yeah. I suspect I suspect peppermint tea has similar properties. Um, I, I'm sorry I can't answer that more precisely, yeah. but I, I suspect it probably still works. I would I would assume. I was actually wondering, um, do you know Ted what gripe water contains? Is it it a have a herbal gripe? basis? Gripe water. Oh, okay. I haven't come across that. Is that very popular and around here or? Uh, you know what, I think it's the sort of thing that um, goes in and out of fashion, but uh, sometimes okay. it's used for unsettled babies and, yeah. Rough water. Okay. Um, I'm not aware of that one specifically, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think I'm missing any questions related to um, functional bowel syndrome Fair symptoms. Enough. Can we go back to... Do we have enough yep. time to just take one or two of the existing questions? Um, yeah, sure. This, uh, I've just got here, um, what if there are multiple um, liver enzyme abnormalities with yes. billion 500, over 500, other and transaminase is over a thousand, but clinically very stable. It's a patient. Mm. Would that okay. person be in hospital or be an outpatient? All right. So what I'd say, um, so what I'd say is that a, a patient with a, it's it's hard for me to imagine this honestly. So a patient who has had a bilirubin of five hundred for a very long time. Is that right? Um, I don't know the duration, but it's it's someone with a very elevated bilirubin and and transaminases, transaminases and gamma GT. So biochemically, right, very so, aberrant, clinically yeah. stable. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd say look, I'd say there are two sides to the coin. So I'd say clinical stability is one thing, but um, if you have a bilirubin of five hundred, I think that to me would indicate to me that I need to look very, very hard for a diagnosis. Um, and I think that uh, when, I, when I was talking before about evaluating for sequelae, so what I meant um, when, I'm going back a bit. So what, what we should be looking for, um, so, so when, when you're looking at the liver tests, I want, we need to think about how bad this is. So if the patient has evidence of acute liver failure or the patient has evidence of cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis, um, I don't think we should be assessing for stability. I think that if we ascertain that this patient has um, a severe liver injury or liver failure or this patient has decompensated cirrhosis, these are specific diagnoses that require immediate um, treatment and investigation and I wouldn't assess them for stability, no. Um, 
Okay, yeah. Um, there's a question just about SSRIs in comparison to tricyclics for IBS. Oh yeah, um, look, uh, I think this, this is really an evolving field. Um, I think the reason that tricyclics have been evaluated to the degree that they have been in RBS is to do with the different mechanisms of action that they have that all appear to, to help irritable bowel. Yeah. It, it's, I think it's entirely plausible to me um, that SSRIs might be helpful. And certainly I think there's a really high um, burden of psychological comorbidity in patients with IBS and I think there's an awful lot of patients with IBS who would benefit from an SSRI. It's just that we yeah. don't have the clinical trial data to support that now. Yep and yeah. maybe Ted because time's pushing on maybe the last question um, is what about the use of mebevirine for IBS? Oh, look, I've, I've, anecdotally, I've heard a lot of good things about Mavaverine. Um, I haven't used it a lot myself, but I do know a lot of people who have used it um, with good success. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't say that it's strongly um, supported by the you know, evidence-based guidelines that we have available to us. Um, but again, it's not, a, it's not a particularly dangerous drug, and I think a trial of Mavaverine is not a bad therapeutic strategy. Yeah. Um, patients with, you know, crampy abdominal pain or IBS. Yep. Yeah. No, that sounds great. Uh, so, so Ted, it's 8.34 and um, I think All we've right. got about a minute left. So I, I wanted to use this time basically to thank you for your really detailed talk. And I think we'll all very much appreciate going over these slides just to try oh. to consolidate some of that knowledge. It's fantastic. Oh, no. so, Thanks everyone for coming. And um, just we've got our final slide up here, just um, encouraging everyone to um, scan this QR code so you can give your feedback um, and uh, help us to fine tune and, and organise further um, teaching in the future. So I, I think, Ted, have you got a final message you might like for the audience? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, um, so, you know, I'm employed full time um, as a staff specialist, gastroenterologist and hepatologist. And, you know, if you have a difficult case or you have a patient you're not sure what to do with, uh, I'm available to, to chat during working hours. You know, we can always talk about these things. All right. OK, so just the organisers listening in, um, anything else that you'd like us to cover or? Oh, good. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much, Ted. Thanks. Yep. Thanks a lot, Ted. And um, we'll we'll close the meeting now. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Okay. Good night. Okay.